by more extended by the x. And the reason is as follows. The modern bioethics is started and founded in the United States. Actually, we have one of the founders of the discipline with us today, Dr. James F. Drain. He's a prominent scholar and one of the founders of the discipline of bioethics. However, because bioethics involves value judgment, and decision making based on values. And because different cultures have different sets of values, of course they won't be in contrast, they shouldn't be in contrast with the common heritage of mankind, especially human rights. But in addition to human universal human rights and freedoms, each culture has its own values, and those values are involved in their decision making on different bioethical issues. In this lecture, we will listen to scholars from different regions of the world, and they will talk to us about their experience and uh, their knowledge, their scholarship, in different areas of bioethics, in different cultures, and with different sets of values. Before introducing the first lectures, I want to thank all my colleagues at the Limbo University who helped me in holding this event, the leadership of the university, all the colleagues who are here and especially Maria, my uh, assistant at Biotics Institute, whose work ethics actually is a great asset to Biotics Institute and to me. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. James F. Drain, the found, one of the founders of Biotics Discipline, to give welcome remarks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Drain. everyone, students and visitors, welcome to uh, the presentation of a couple of programs in this discipline of bioethics. You may not know it, but your university is recognized worldwide for its role in the creation of this new discipline and for the continuing development of this discipline. And the discipline, of course, is bioethics. Uh, scholars from around the world every year win financial support to come here to Edinburgh University to do research and to produce new works in this new discipline, which will be used in their own countries and then in other places around the world to disseminate and to enlarge the interest in the discipline. Uh, the uh, new discipline, bioethics, was created by just a couple of different persons, two persons in, in particular. Uh, the first, sad to say, just recently died. His name is Daniel Callahan. He was widely respected academically for things that he had written, and mainly for the establishment of a new bioethics research center in New York, which is known now worldwide 
in the area of medicine and ethics. Dan Callahan, very good friend of mine. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, besides the, the, the new academic discipline which was created by, by Dan and by myself, um, that there are all kinds of programs now around the world in this discipline. Uh, this James F. Drain uh, Bioethics Institute here in Edinburgh was actually the creation of one of the vice presidents of this university. By a big surprise to me, I was coming down the hall one time of, over in the library and going to do some study and I saw this plaque on the wall. I looked at it and said, James F. Drake Bioethics Institute. Hell, that's, that's I. <laughs> now, now what? But that's the way it happens in the world, I guess. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, it was created by, by a, one of the uh, one of the vice presidents of the university, and it's about 50 years ago now. Uh, it was created uh, for research by young scholars from around the world, and these young scholars receive certain amount of support financially to come here and to stay here and to be housed and be fed here at the university. The Bioethics Institute provides the academic materials for their research. Today, all of you are in attendance and will have an opportunity to meet and to listen to three different bioethics invitees bioethics scholars that are here this year to do their research. You'll get to know them. They'll be Dr. <coughs> Dr. Olinda Teams from India, Dr. Cornelius Ewusho from Nigeria, and uh, Dr. C Dina Senora from Palestine. They will be enriched by their residence and by their academic projects here at the university. And uh, Edinburgh students, you all, will also be enriched by their being here, by you getting to know them, to talk to them, to hear about the research that they're doing. This will be a benefit to us at the university as well as to all of you individually. <clears throat> the, uh, the Edinburgh students, of course, will benefit, but there will be benefits from their work here transmitted to all sorts of other places, especially to the places from which they come. They'll promote this mystery, and they will get to know something about our university. So get ready to listen to them. Stay around for a few minutes if you have time to get to know them, to get to talk to them just a little bit. And uh, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy their remarks and will learn from them about bioethics and about their lives back home. Now, for the first speaker we have, Doctor, oh, you're going to introduce her? Okay, go ahead. I won't mention her name. <laughs> Dr. Kia will tell us who the first speaker is. Thank you. you have to take her out. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, 
Also, I would like to thank all the students who came here on Friday. I appreciate you for taking time. And uh, also, my many thanks to the leadership of the College of Science and Health Professions for their support to the Biotis Institute, in valuable support to the Biotis Institute, and for their presence here at the second session of James and Dorian Lecture Series. I would like to invite Dr. Roy Shin, the Associate Dean of the College of Science and Health Professions, to give our next welcome address today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, you know, just last Friday, I had uh, the honor of um, taking one of the new members of the Athletic Hall of Fame to meet with uh, members of the team that she was on um, 20 years ago when she was a student athlete here. And she was from the Czech Republic and has a very um, uh, compelling story. I mean, you know, left her family, got on an airplane with $200, and is still in the U.S. And, um, and so I, one of the messages that I told them was, and, you know, she dramatically improved things at Edinburgh when she came here. I mean, they were like third and fifth best, best team in the United States. And um, I said to the existing, the current students, what a tradition you come from. And that that is something that is, not everybody gets. And it's, uh, it's the same way here today. You know, talking about uh, Dr. Drain is, uh, is a real honor for me. I was asked to just say a couple, a few personal things. Um, we've known each other for a long time. Um, he taught philosophy courses here uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And um, uh, moral reasoning, religion, and, and medical ethics as well. Um, he talked a little bit about the Bioethics Institute in the year 2000, so 19 years ago. Um, he was named the Russell Roth Professor of Bioethics. Do I have that right, Jim? Is that 2000? Um, and he, I don't think he'll mind me telling you that he's 90 years old. He still goes to work every day. Right? So he's a great source of inspiration. Um, <laughs> last year, he published his 21st book entitled Medicine, Ethics, and Religion. So, um, you know, when you're feeling a little down and maybe you know you, you don't have enough energy that day, just think of, think of what this guy does every day. Um, uh, just a couple years ago, maybe a year or two ago, he went and met with his good friend. He's a friend of the Pope. So he met with, uh, had a personal audience with uh, Pope Francis. And uh, my wife, actually grew up across the street from him. And so their families did a lot of uh, things together uh, throughout their, throughout her childhood and, uh, and his children's childhood as well. And are still, you know, we're still very good friends, obviously, today. Um, I was an undergraduate at Edinburgh and never had the good fortune of having Dr. Drain for class. Um, but I taught, um, I later, when I came back and, and was teaching here, I was teaching a professional ethics course, and I went to him for some advice for, you know, what things to highlight and what's how to do it effectively, what matters. I, I, I'm going to guess that there are a number of you in the audience that want to become health professionals, and what drew me to becoming a health profession, health professional was knowing that there was a high standard that when, you know, when no one else was looking, that people in my, in our profession chose to do the right thing, you know, collectively. They understood the reason why. And so we talked about these things for hours in his living room. Um, you know, the importance of ethical professional practice and research um, across generations and across different circumstances. Because every single generation has to get it right. Right? Or else we lose the public trust. So whatever field you're going into, though that population needs to believe that 
that when you make a recommendation to them, it's in their interest, not in your interest, right, primarily. Uh, we talked about the essential characteristics that were needed in health professionals and how to effectively impart the principles and the why, the rationale, and the courage that you need. Because it's easy to talk about it when there's no heat, right? It's only when there's pressure or an incentive to do the wrong thing, right, that personally benefits you. That's when you have to be able to not just know what the right thing is, but actually follow it, right? Um, so this actually led me into some great things in my own discipline uh, that I really um, benefited greatly from. I was on a national board of ethics and um, presented and published in that area. So it was, um, it was pretty special. Um, Dr. Drain and I have traveled down to Allegheny College, uh, hosts a, an annual um, medical ethics um, lecture series, and we've gone down there several times. Um, every single time, I think, the presenters like knew him, <laughs> and he was just an old friend to them. Um, one was Dr. Hank Tenhavik, I hope I didn't push her that too bad, of Duquesne Center for Bioethics. And he had a brand new PhD, this was just a couple years ago, had a brand new PhD graduate, or about to be graduate, at the time named Dr. Kia Aramesh, who he recommended for this position, because he, he knew that we were in the process of creating this um, at the time. And so he's perfect. It was like a perfect thing because he's a physician as well as a bioethicist. He can teach biology courses as well as direct the uh, uh, Bioethics Institute. Um, and, and then we added a bioethics course that pretty much all of our health professional students now take early on, which makes a lot of us very happy to see that happen. Um, th there's, a, there's a Catholic hymn entitled We Are Call that includes this verse, and it reminds me of Dr. Green whenever I hear it song. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God. Um, about a year ago, there was a popular country song entitled, I Believe Most People Are Good. Some of you may have heard that that was intended to encourage us to be more open to the goodness in our fellow brothers and sisters. Jim believes all people have goodness within them that just needs guidance, role models, and courage to reveal itself. And he spent a lifetime doing that. He continues to do so by helping to mentor Dr. Aramash and the Institute's visiting scholars, um, whose work will be shared this afternoon. Jim, thanks for all you've done for this university, the field of bioethics, and the people fortunate enough to be called your friends. James F. Drain Fellows in Bioethics at Edinburgh University, currently. They will be talking about the research. Uh, the first fellow who will be speaking here is Dr. Uh, Cornelius Erozo, uh, and born and raised in Nigeria, Cornelius is currently a candidate fellow at the Department of Philosophy at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He was a recipient of the Santander Ethics and Society Scholarship of Theories and Application in like Theories and Application from Fordham University, an international visiting fellow at the Institute for Medical Ethics and History of Medicine in Royal University in Bochum, Germany, 
a visiting scholar at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at, and Law at Tajwani University of Leuven in Belgium, and the Center for Research and Bioethics in Uppsala University. Where is Uppsala? Sweden. In Sweden. So, <laughs> for his research stay at the James F. Twain, Cornell is working on incidental, incidental ethical issues of incidental findings in, re, in clinical research. And he is addressing the issue from an Ubuntu perspective. What is an Ubuntu perspective? That's what I am passionate to hear from Dr. Zuhabuzo. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Zuhabuzo. Uh, and his lecture is titled Comparing Ubuntu with Western Philosophy as a Foundation for Bioethics. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so sorry about the delay. Uh, my name is Cornelius Yemusho. I am a consolidated fellow, currently a consolidated fellow at the Center for Applied Ethics. Stellenbosch University. It is really a great privilege to be here at the university and benefit from Dr. Dream's many years of research in bioethics and Dr. Kea's own research too in bioethics. I have suddenly realized how difficult it is to talk about Ubuntu in just 15 minutes, but I will try my best. My immediate objective today is to show how Ubuntu, or to argue the thesis that Ubuntu philosophy is a useful philosophy that can supplement current medical ethics guidelines and ethical approaches, legal codes, and be of assistance in addressing a variety of bioethical issues. Um, now I'm wearing all black because I'm actually playing with a new idea. It's either going to end up in my funeral or in my victory. But I hope it will be in my victory. 
Last year, at the University of Oxford, I attended a conference where one of the speakers narrated a story of a couple in several discordant relationship. The couple, the husband and the wife, had approached their physician for a regular checkup. Blood samples were drawn, and both parties agreed that those samples should go to the lab for a test. The test results came back with surprising outcomes. The test results show that the husband was HIV positive, but the wife was negative. The physician informs the husband about the results and says she plans to let the wife know about the husband's serial conversion. But the, the man, for fear of losing his wife, told the physician that he wants his own private information kept confidential. But this is the problem. Both husband and wife are patients of this particular physician. And when the physician, when the presenter narrated this story, he described the story as one of the ethical issues which keep doctors away often at night. The case is a typical example of the conflict between, or the conflict that can occur between the duty to one and the duty to maintain patients' confidentiality. As a young bioethics student, we were told that whenever we are faced with ethical issues, you should proceed this way. First, step through the norms, the available legal codes for guidance. And if you cannot find guidance there, go through the professional codes or guidelines. And if you still cannot find adequate guidance, go through adequate guidance. Go through the hospital policies or traditions. Ask your senior colleagues or your senior fellows, ask them the question, how have they treated or addressed similar cases like the ones you are experiencing? And when you still cannot find an adequate guidance, then apply the ethical theories, the ethical approaches. Serial discordancy is at the heart of HIV transmission. And as has been repeatedly confirmed by several empirical studies. Most of the new infections occur amongst individuals in several discordant relationships. So stopping the spread of the virus amongst individuals in several discordant relationships would contribute significantly towards the realization of the United, Go United Nations goal to eliminate HIV and AIDS by 2030. There is a way current legal codes and professional guidelines have addressed the conflicts between patient confidentiality and partner notification or the duty to one that is currently undermining the effort to spread, to stop the spread of the virus. In both legal codes, and medical guidance. A physician may breach patient confidentiality only when the patient has refused to consider other options of preventing infection. That is, if breaching confidentiality is the only known way of preventing infection. If the patient has communicated a threat to infect others, and those who are at risk are actually identifiable. In the absence of these conditions. Patient's right to control his or her own information should always be honored. But this is problematic. An HIV patient, an HIV positive patient only needs to promise that he or she would consider other options of preventing infection without actually taking advantage of those options. In 2010, Professor Mehta and Padikaku conducted a study where they found that between 40% and 65% of those of HIV positive patients who promise to inform their wives or their partners 
or take advantage of preventive measures, actually failed to do so. Do we now know why most of the new infections occur amongst individuals in several discordant relationships? Because the outlook in most legal codes, the outlook in correct guidance, which favor patient confidentiality over partner notification, is less likely to ensure that those who are at risk of infection are given an opportunity to take advantage of preventive measures. And in some countries and regions like the US and the UK respectively, when notifying a spouse of an HIV positive patient, the physician notifying because the patient has communicated a threat to infect others, the identity of the patient, of the HIV positive patient, must always be protected, be concealed. And this is also problematic. If the spouse was faithful, she would know, he would know who has exposed her to the virus. Most companies, most policies, most hospital policies align with current legal codes, they align with professional guidance. And like most codes, patient confidentiality is a sacred duty. In order for HIV care and transmission to be truly effective, I believe a shift from the question, when is it ethical or legal to breach confidentiality, there is the need for a shift from the question, when is it ethical or legal to breach confidentiality to when is it ethical or legal not to notify the HIV positive patient's partners? This shift needs to occur. I want us to consider for a moment. But before that, now we have seen that medical guidelines are not very effective in preventing transmission. But what about ethical approaches. <coughs> we could turn to dominant ethical approaches for bringing about this shift. But these dominant theories too are, in my opinion, equally limited. Some top contenders are utilitarianism. For example, the utilitarian theory says that the morality of a nation depends solely on the consequences and consequences matter to the extent that they bring about the happiness of individuals. And the assessment of consequences, each individual's happiness gets equal consideration. It is not always the case. It is not always justice to treat everyone equally. Moreover, Individual rights matter in themselves, not merely because they contribute to the overall uh, happiness. But the issue about confidentiality, about putting so much emphasis on confidentiality, and about how this emphasis is having the effort to stop the spread of the disease, has been adequately described by Dubin in an article he published in 2009. It says the confidentiality policy also tied the hands of medical doctors, for they had no right to do an HIV or AIDS test on anyone without the patient's consent. If the doctors could gather from various patterns of persistent opportunistic infections or through other investigations, they still had no right to test the patient of HIV. If and when doctors had been given the right to test, and the patient was found positive, the doctors have no power to insist on partner notification, since this would violate the individual rights of the concerned person. Given this policy, they are aware, and there are still many cases where relatives are taking care of very sick relatives without knowing the status of their patients. The results are sometimes very tragic. We could also turn to other top contenders. Um, now I want to consider the Kantian ethics. Kantian ethics which defines 
Morally right action as one which enhances an individual's capacity for autonomy. Kant's second formulation of the categorical imperative appears to be very relevant here. Kant says, act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, always as an end and never as a means only. This imperative is Kant's basis for respect for person. Based on Kant's second formulation to respect persons, there is really no basis for preferring the husband's right to confidentiality over the wife's right to be notified. So this theory also does not get permissible bias rights. These dominant theories, dominant Western theories, I believe should be supplemented with a relational theory which gets permissible bias rights and can account for the intrinsic value of each person. And I think Ubuntu philosophy is just the right candidate for that. Ubuntu philosophy is an essentially relational philosophy, and it has its origins in the oral culture of the Bantu people in southern Africa. It emphasizes interdependence, it emphasizes social harmony, and other regarding values. In fact, one becomes more or less of a person to the extent that the individual prizes other regarding values, such as care, such as love, such as respect. And that's the maxim, I am because we are. We are, therefore, I am. Umuntu, Umuntu, Gabantu. In Max, in Max's opinion, the communal character of Ubuntu requires a blend of identifying with others, thinking of oneself as a part of a we, and exhibiting solidarity with others, as showing empathy and caring for the condition of others. A combination of identifying with others and exhibiting solidarity is also required for development of one's person in this philosophy. And that's the ultimate moral rule in the philosophy. If the ultimate moral rule is that the right action is one which connects rather than divide individuals in harmonious relationship. And this is how I believe Ubuntu's emphasis on social coercion on communal relationship helps to address the conflicts between patient confidentiality and partner notification and placed the emphasis on partner notification. I have formulated two rules from the ultimate rule, but this is what the rules essentially imply. That it is one, a right action is one that connects individuals in a relationship of harmony. The physician, in this particular case, the case that I'm considering, has a duty to notify the wife of age of the husband's HIV status, since this is necessary for both the husband and the wife to appropriately identify with each other and exhibit solidarity with one another, even if this might entail a loss of the husband's right to confidentiality. And this is also how some scholars in African philosophy have also justified a loss of confidentiality. They say, confidentiality policy raises fear. The policy raises shame and isolation, rejection, anger, stigma, and discrimination, as well as inhibits early diagnosis. Confidentiality policy encourages HIV positive patients to bear their bodies by themselves rather than share such bodies with those who also care for one's illness. Confidentiality policy also encourages others from caring for HIV patients since it sends a message which says that HIV is not a disease like all other diseases that we have to tackle together, but the body of the individual. But in African philosophy, a disease is never entirely the body of the individual alone. 
In Ubuntu philosophy, what affects the individual also affects the community. In fact, the individual and the community are co-substantively constituted in this uh, philosophy. Moreover, an emphasis on partner notification ties very well, in my opinion, with the UN strategies for ending HIV and the AIDS epidemic by 2030. It ensures that those who are at risk of infection are given the opportunity to make informed decisions about taking advantage of available preventive options. It will also lower the rates of new infections in several discordant relationships. Now, somebody may make the claim that notifying others, such as informing the wife of the husband's serial conversion, will expose the husband to harm, such as discrimination. The wife may, for example, leave him. His community may expel or ostracize him. Now, I want to say that the aim of my paper, and before I talk about the aim, if this happens, if the husband is discriminated against, if the wife leaves the husband, it will at least not be a failure of the principles of this philosophy. It will not be the failure of Ubuntu philosophy itself, but a failure of the wife but a failure of the community to be the sort of being Ubuntu mandates. Beings will care for the good of others. Beings will love other persons. Beings will exhibit solidarity for other persons. It is not the aim of this presentation to convince anyone to live by the principles of Ubuntu philosophy or even to argue that current normative frameworks are completely useless and must be replaced by Ubuntu philosophy. Rather, my aim has been to demonstrate that living by the values and the principles of Ubuntu is more conducive to, for achieving the global goal of ending HIV and AIDS epidemic by 2030 and addressing the ethical conflicts between partner notification and patient confidentiality in several discordant relationships. Thank you. of India with surrogate motherhood, 
we talk in the biotics class about surrogate motherhood and the ethical problem arises from practicing surrogate motherhood. One of the most uh, interesting experiences on surrogate motherhood happened in India. And today we will listen to a lecture that describes the first hand uh, experience and uh, academic work on the issue in India. Thank you, Dr. Teams, and here is this. Do you have a talk to Thank you, Dr. Aramesh, for that introduction. And I must say I'm very glad to be here at the Edinburgh University and enjoy your hospitality. Especially for me, it is a very great honor to have met Dr. James Drain and interacted with him uh, at the Bioethics Institute. He's a legend, a living legend of our time, and especially a legend uh, in America. So it's my pleasure today to share with you about an issue of bioethical concern in my country, that is the use of technology in medicine. And this is what led to the rise and fall of surrogacy, commercial surrogacy in India. But these are some headlines which sent shockwaves through the medical reproduction uh, establishment in our country in 2016, when the government decided to ban all commercial arrangements in surrogacy. In effect, really, it shouldn't have been such a surprise, because as you will see from, uh, from what I share now, there were very substantial events that led to this um, ban on commercial surrogacy in India. So to begin with, let's talk about um, uh, the technology itself. We are speaking here about in vitro fertilization, which is that where the sperm and the ovum meet outside the human body um, in laboratory situations to create an embryo. And this embryo is then transferred into the uterus for gestation and, uh, gestation and childbirth. So this uh, technology has led to various uh, types of in vitro fertilization. You would have heard AIT, AIH, artificial insemination, ZIFT, GIFT, gamete intrafallopian transfer, and ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. These are all variations of the same medical technology that uh, is used to in, in infertile couples to have children when they when infertility is a problem uh, with patients. So you may have heard that around the 1970s, of course, everyone here would know. Late 1970s, one would have heard of baby Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, was born in UK, successfully uh, managed. Uh, in the UK, and that was the first test tube baby. But what people probably do not know uh, widely is that just two months after Louise Brown was born, baby Kanupriya was born in a hospital in Calcutta. Now, the reason that is this is less known is that the the documentation around this case was incomplete, and so the the uh, award or the recognition for uh, in vitro fertilization and babies born from it was actually uh, awarded to Dr. Hinduja from, who had who uh, was able to do this in Bombay at the KEM hospital there and that was baby Harsha. So the reason I'm telling you the, this is that the science was already in place uh, in India even in the late 70s. And already clinicians were developing the technology and beginning to use it way back then. Now coming to the types of surrogacy, surrogacy itself is the use of a third party in reproduction 
where a couple uses in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. But the embryo transfer happens to the surrogate, and the surrogate will carry the pregnancy, give birth to the child, and the child is handed over to uh, the parents. So that is surrogacy. Now the types of surrogacy, the traditional one, the genetic surrogacy, where the mother, the surrogate, is the biological and genetic mother of the child. So here, the surrogate will contribute the ovum, the genetic material that goes into the in vitro fertilization. And the other type of surrogacy, the one which we are all familiar with and which is in use today, is the gestational surrogacy, where the mother is the biological mother of the child, but does not contribute any genetic material. This means that both the, the sperm and the ovum is contributed by others, and the mother herself, the surrogate mother herself, is not the genetic mother. So in this case, there are five possible parents, uh, the intended parents, the genetic parents, and the surrogate mother. So altruistic surrogacy is one in which there is no fee for service, but this person, this surrogate mother, will agree to carry the pregnancy for reasons of compassion or empathy with infertile parents, and only her medical bills and certain expenditures will be covered. But in commercial surrogacy, beyond those expenses, there will also be a payment for the service of surrogacy. So in India now, then, soon after the development of this, and starting from the 90s, uh, some uh, uh, surrogacy started getting commercialized. The first documented case was of a woman in Gujarat who agreed to carry uh, a surrogate baby for an infertile couple, and she agreed to do it for money because she needed that money to treat to pay for the treatment of her paralyzed husband. <clears throat> this is the kind of uh, this is a very uh, popular magazine that I, I have you have here, and uh, they were speaking of suddenly this widespread adoption of the technology and the monetization or the monetizing of this assisted reproductive technologies. The, num the number of infertility clinics began to grow and the number of children born through surrogacy each year grew <coughs> from around 200 in the late 80s to 2000. So, this was this is the kind of image that uh, that people began to understand of the surrogacy industry, where you have uh, this, uh, the, the parents parents who infertile uh, couples who are very grateful to surrogates who are able to give them a child, and this is the kind of image that began uh, when when this technology was used in the first place, but. With the spread of it, with the spread, this idea changed. And people began to see that there were more dimensions to use of this technology. So what are some of the factors that spawned this industry in India? There were regulatory factors. Because uh, the regulators and the lawmakers were slow to really to, um, take charge of this technology because they asked questions about whether it was a treatment. Is this a medical treatment? Is infertility a disease? Is it an illness? Is it just a human condition? And um, would they have to intervene? What do the experts say? They were looking to the, to the medical experts for guidance. And if this is a technology, and in that case, should they be regulating it to the health ministry, which ministry? And so the regulations that emerged were rather inadequate at that time. And this also was one of the factors. Then there was a great amount of technical expertise in India, with the doctors being, getting more and more proficient in the technology. And they were selling this idea of a solution to the problem of infertility, a way in which people could have children without too much of difficulty. And then, of course, the most ominous reason and, and a factor that grew the industry was the availability of surrogates in India. Women who found a way in which they could earn far more than they could through their normal livelihoods. 
desperate women in uh, urban settings who found that this was one way in which they could easily get their hands on money that was needed for the family, to settle loans, to uh, educate their children, to have a livelihood. And so that was the start of the baby boom in, in India. Uh, it started in the 90s. So the permissive regulations that were there led India to join the list of the very few countries that allow commercial surrogacy. This was not something that we were proud of, but this is how uh, it, it, it turned out. It was the cost differential that really grew this industry into a multi-million dollar industry. Uh, while people in Europe and the United States would have to pay something around $80,000 or $100,000 for the whole process uh, of uh, surrogacy, in India this would cost around $20,000. So that was the difference and that led to this boom in medical tourism uh, and reproductive tourism as they would call it. And so a World Bank study in 2012 said that the, the industry in India was valued at around 400 million a year across 3,000 clinics. And the BBC News reports valued it at 2.3 billion annually with 5,000 surrogates born every year. It's not really clear about the numbers because just since there were very few regulations, there wasn't really a clear idea on how many clinics there were and how many uh, arrangements, uh, commercial arrangements were going on. So approximately what we know is about 12,000 foreigners sought surrogacy services every year. And most of them were from the USA, UK, Australia, and Europe. And so these were the kind of unflattering media headlines that appeared. Surrogacy capital of the world, rent a womb, baby outsourcing, and this was not what the Indian people would like to see. So there was a pushback and there was a lot of uproar and, and a protest in India around this time. This is not the image of India Incorporated. And it was neither the image of spiritual India. And people began to speak up. So let us go through some very quickly some of the social, legal, and ethical concerns. This photograph here is one of a poster doctor of surrogacy in India. Many would have heard of her. But what I want you to look at is the, the surrogates around her with their masks and shrouded persona. So the, the mask, the, you know, they were not willing to be photographed. They did not want to be known. Somehow they were not very happy with what they were doing. But the medical side of it was very, you know, enthusiastic about using this technology and how it could be used for others. So there was a kind of exploitation. So what we saw uh, happening in India was an exploitation just from looking at the profile of these women. Where are these women from? They were from urban slums. They were from semi-urban towns. People who had no other means to earn. Women who had very few, mean, a very difficult uh, livelihood. So they would earn far less than what they could earn through this. And so there was this issue of the link with poverty and surrogacy. Poverty and lack of choices, which was an ethical concern. And the gender issue as well. Once again, women. Women in India who are discriminated right from the time that they are in their mother's womb with female feticide, sex determination, um, and onwards, right through their lives. And here was one more area in which they faced discrimination and exploitation. And, on the, and in spite of this, there were questions asked from the feminist side. Didn't women have a right to decide when the government could not provide and society does not provide for women's welfare, do the women not have a right over their bodies to offer it as surrogates and earn from it when they do? Then there were the rights of surrogate women, which were also being called into question. What were some of these rights 
did the, did the surrogate woman have a right to refuse when the baby was born, refuse to hand over the baby? Did she have a right to terminate the pregnancy if she changed her mind? Did she have the right to opt out of the arrangement altogether halfway through the process? What are the rights of surrogate women? This was unclear. Who, were the, who was in charge of protecting these women, these vulnerable women? Was it the government? Was it the doctor? Was it the health system? Remember, we do not have universal health care in India. So who looks after the health of the mother after the event, if she falls ill? Then there was the needs of commissioning parents. The parents who come into this uh, process, what are their expectations? Will they expect, will they accept any child that is born? Will they have rights to decide and determine what the surrogate mother will do during her time of pregnancy, or what she will eat, or what she will, um, how she will live. Many of these women were incarcerated into hostels and kept away from their families during the pregnancy. The doctors felt that that was one way to ensure that they were well nourished and protected from infections. But these women were taken away from their families for nine months. And then there's, of course, the issue of this cross-border, international cross-border medical tourism in Vibraj. And the, the entire capitalistic, global capitalistic outlook, where people in whose countries decided that commercial surrogacy was not for them. This is something they did not agree with. Those, those citizens would cross over to another country where the regulations were not even in place, and take advantage of lax regulations and available women. And this was an ethical concern. And then there was a talk about the legal aspect of the contract. Were such commercial contracts enforceable at all? The objective of the, trans of the contract is a child. Is that possible? And then a price is being placed on a human function. Can you, can you enforce a contract between two people to enforce the, can you, of this kind where is it possible to insist that the mother, the birth mother, gives up her child? What if she does not want to do that? And can you force the intended parents to take a child if they suddenly change their mind and decide they don't want it? Is it in the best interest of the child? at that point, in whose interest will such contracts be? Then of course there is the issues of, with the child being the object of this contract. The citizenship of the child was constantly being a, a matter of concern which, when it was, we are dealing with cross-country uh, reproduction. The identity of the child, who is the mother of the child, who is the genetic mother and who is the birth mother, and though this was known to the doctor, Regulations in different countries differed. And this is where there was a problem, uh, recurring again and again. The family relationships too, uh, people struggled with this. Who were these children born to be surrogates and how were they related to the surrogate's own family? There were children across the world who would find that they, they were surrogate children, uh, and they would find that they were linked by a common father and they would find each other on the internet, their stepbrothers and sisters, and try to connect with those families. So a lot of issues with family borders and family concerns of this nature. And then, of course, the ethical issue of the complicity of doctors who played up the emotion of childless couples, the discrimination faced in India by childless couples, the stigma attached to childlessness, and they worked into that demand for a child. And they, and they built that up and, and obscured uh, the ethical and the social implications of the technology. The other issue with doctors was that they were the experts on the panels that were discussing regulation. And that was a huge conflict of interest. And so some of the stories that made the headlines very quickly, baby Manji was a, a child born to a, a Japanese couple that came to India for surrogacy. Uh, the, the father donated the sperm, and they had a Indian mother as a surrogate. 
Now, very close to the time that the baby was to be born, uh, the couple divorced, and the wife said that she did not want, she was not interested in the child anymore, and she went back to Japan. And then the child was born, and the father could not adopt the child because in India the laws say that a girl child cannot be adopted by a single male parent. So the child was left behind, and they went to this case went to the courts. The, 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 the Japanese father for some time tried to insist on paternity tests and insist on taking the child, but the courts would not allow it since the birth mother was Indian. And then his visa expired, so he had to go back to Japan. So this created an incident which was splashed all across the news. So finally it was resolved amicably when the grandmother from Japan came to India and took baby Manji back. The other story was with Jan Malas and his wife from Germany, they came, they, they had this child in Gujarat and they wanted to put their names on the birth certificate uh, but the courts don't allow that. The birth mother gets onto the birth certificate and then the baby is uh, adopted. And so this caused a lot of confusion at that time and uh, the baby was held back in India. They had to go back to Germany, get permissions. Germany did not recognize our new children. And so they had to get Indian passports for the two children. And they, had, they couldn't take the children away because it was like trafficking. When you just take Indian children away from India, that, would, that looked like trafficking. And so those issues also, well, finally these things got resolved, but this caused a lot of media uh, 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 you know, upheaval. Then there was the story of the Australian twins, where the Australian couple had uh, uh, used a surrogate in India. And then a boy and a girl were born. And the, fact, the couple decided that they would just like to take the girl because they had a boy already and uh, they would not like to have the boy. So they just take the girl and leave the boy behind. Now, this was uh, not possible, it was unacceptable, but they refused. And is it in the best interest of the child to force the child onto a couple that doesn't want to take it? And so that became the concern. And the Australian High Commission said they didn't think it was in the interest of the child to force the child uh, onto the parents, and so the Indian government decided to take the child, but before that happened, the Australian couple found a friend in India who would adopt that child, so all ended well. There was an anxious moment in between when they thought that the child had been trafficked, but this was the crisis with the Australian couple. Then there was a the death of a surrogate in Gujarat in 2012, another Canadian couple <coughs> who uh, were ready to take their children away, uh, when the child, children were born, and then the Canadian government required a paternity test to be done on the twins uh, who had to be carried away. And they found to their horror that although the father was, the father uh, had donated the sperm, they found that the paternity test didn't match. And so there was a confusion of whether the clinic let them down in some way or got the samples mixed up. And so they were not allowed to take these uh, children for the longest time until finally this, this, uh, uh, this whole thing got resolved with the Indian government saying that they would take the children and keep them in India in a home uh, and then we work out a way in which uh, these, this couple would find another set of children to adopt. But they were not allowed to take this set of twins with them. And then at the time of the uh, Nepal earthquake, now Nepal is a country that does not allow its women to be surrogates, but it allows the birth, any woman to come to their country and give birth. So um, surrogates in India were going to Nepal to give birth there because that country allowed the names of the intended parents to be put on the birth certificate. This becomes important when they have to uh, prepare the passport for the children. So Indian surrogates used to go there and give birth there in Nepal and the children would be taken away by the foreigners there. Now when the, when the earthquake struck Nepal in 2015, it caused a sensation when Israeli helicopters flew into Nepal, picked up the little surrogate babies and the Israelis who were waiting there for the babies to be born and left the surrogate mothers behind. So there were there were these surrogate mothers who were left without a means of looking after themselves. Some of them post having given birth and some of them had not given birth at all. And they were just left there at the mercy of the elements when, uh, when the earthquake happened.
So all of these things, you know, shocked the media, and there was complete social condemnation uh, in, ev in every form. There were films, books, stories in the media, protests by social organizations, women's organizations. The Ministry of Health called for the Indian Council of Medical Research to come up with something uh, to, to deal with the social and legal issues. And, and the, the council was saying that you could have commercial surrogacy for, for those whom it was physically and medically impossible or undesirable to carry a baby to term, which was very, very difficult for people. And the Law Commission was advocating for laws that protect the right, rights and obligation of all parties. Many books, many movies, Chori Chori, Chupke Chupke, these are movies which are seen across the world. <coughs> Google Baby and, and also these books like uh, Baby Makers and Politics of the Womb. And so some guidelines emerged, ICMR guidelines, but they were still very tentative. They addressed everything about the technology, the clinics, the doctors, everything except these issues that we spoke about, the ethical issues and how those could be addressed. They talked about the age limit of women, the birth number of births that they could uh, undergo, the surrogate mother, the documentation, the types of people who could, but not the, so the issues at the heart of the problem. And so this bill went through successive um, formats and uh, improvements, but it still didn't get adopted till finally the government said, you are not looking at the issue of commercial surrogacy. This is the big issue. The rest of them, the clinics and how they will be regulated can be done later. So they just came down with this huge finding, they came down with this surrogacy regulation bill in 2016, which has been going in for parliamentary review, and that is why it's gone on to 2019. They're expecting that this bill will be uh, passed through both houses this year successfully. It has been dragged on because of the very, very strong lobby of people who own the clinics and who are back in, backing the clinics and invested in them. And so that is why it's taken so long for it. But over the last three years, all commercial arrangements and surrogacy have not been on. Now, it, it allows altruistic surrogacy, but it also talks about regulation of the clinic. And it's not a perfect bill, and it requires to be uh, updated in many, many ways. And we definitely still need the assisted reproductive technologies bill. To talk. It talks about the actual technology itself and the clinics, but for now, Surrogacy has been bad. And I'm happy at the end of it. If you'd like to ask any questions, we'd happy to answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thanks for a very interesting uh, lecture. We had the uh, and we have, still have uh, the same problem in other countries. For example, in Iran, there is no laws and regulations, but because it is a very profitable practice, the clinics took fatwas from religious leaders to allow the practice commercial surrogacy, and they have started the practice, and nobody actually dares to oppose those fatwas and stop them. And we have a lot of problems similar to what you mention maybe, I don't want to take the time of next presenter, uh, but maybe in the class I can give my students some examples of problems that happened in Iran. Also in the United States there was the case of baby M and other cases as a result of practicing surrogacy, so that's a very interesting topic. Our next speaker is, and she will be our last speaker, then we will have an answer question and answer session, and then we will have the reception uh, so we can also continue talking informally over uh, a small reception. So our, our next speaker is uh, Dina Signora. Uh, Dina was born and raised in Palestine and she is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in healthcare ethics at Duke University. Dina has been a graduate assistant at the Center for Health Charities for three years, and she, every year she plans and coordinates the Integrity of Creation Conference. The conference series was commissioned by the former president of Duquesne University. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Sciences with distinction, along with a minor in public health from American University of Beirut, 
and a master's degree in business administration from Duke University as a Fulbright scholar. The Fulbright program is sponsored by the United States Department of State. Uh, Dina's uh, lecture is titled The Approach of Health Related Organizations Toward Complementary Medicine, a Comparative Study Between Arabic Countries and the United States. Thank you, Dina, and uh, here is. Uh, Hello. Hi. I'm so happy to be here presenting my presentation and my research with Dr. Armash. Um, I'm actually conducting my research uh, from Pittsburgh uh, at Duke University because I have classes to give and uh, uh, I, could, I cannot be here in person, but we collaborate through uh, email and meetings. So uh, we're, uh, our topic is a comparative study of the approach of health uh, organizations toward complementary medicine. Uh, we're trying to study the differences and similarities of uh, complementary medicine between the Middle East mainly and the United States. So first, uh, what's the definition of uh, complementary medicine? Um, uh, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, they define the complementary medicine as a non-stream, uh, non-mainstream practice used together with conventional medicine, while alternative medicine is defined as a non-mainstream practice used in place of conventional medicine. And uh, when we talk about traditional medicine, we refer to both complementary and alternative medicine. And it's defined by the WHO as the knowledge, skills, and practices based on the theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures used in the maintenance of health and in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement, or treatment of physical and mental illness. And uh, both integrative and complementary medicine, they're both on the rise globally in the Middle East, in uh, America, in Europe, everywhere. And uh, they use, people use it mainly to treat chronic conditions like cancer, for example, because uh, sometimes people lose hope and there's no effective treatment, so they try to rely on more natural uh, uh, medicine and uh, to treat also diseases that cause so much pain, like arthritis or, or uh, bowel syndrome, for instance. Uh, in spite of all the growing use of com uh, complementary medicine, it is still not uh, taught for uh, doctors or healthcare professionals. All over the world, it's still not integrated in the, their programs. So by, uh, these are some examples of complementary uh, medicine, uh, aromatherapy, herbal medicine, meditation, massages, and uh, acupuncture, all yoga, and all such these things. So I'll start talking about the Middle East uh, first, and then I'll go to the United States. Uh, in the Middle East, there's a high affinity for uh, complementary medicine. Why? Because the uh, Arabs have historical roots in ancient uh, Arabic medicine and doctors, uh, the Arab doctors, they had a great contribution to the immune system uh, and to the micro microbiological sciences. They uh, worked hard in this and uh, advanced the field of complementary medicine. And also because Arabs uh, back uh, back home, I mean, yeah, it's uh, widely available, accessible, and it's, uh, it's not that expensive like here in the US, it's cheap, and basically people from the lower class or average people who can get it and have access to it, uh, because it's like they use it as a first line treatment or they use it with other uh, proven medicines. So uh, I found many articles talking about complementary medicine uh, in oncology in the Middle East. And uh, this is on the rise in the world, in Europe and the US, and also uh, in the Middle East. Uh, 
namely Turkey, Jordan, and uh, Israel, Iran, and Saudi Arabia too. Uh, many uh, studies discuss the importance of complementary medicine uh, in these countries, and, um, and uh, mostly they use herbal medicine, herbal medicine for uh, cancer-related diseases. So what herbs they use, examples are turmeric, uh, garlic, black cumin, Camel, they also use camel's milk and uh, green tea. So, uh, and usually doctors would have a generally high uh, positive attitude toward uh, these herbal products and they advise them to their patient in, uh, uh, in conjugation with other uh, well effective treatments. However, uh, there aren't enough studies that prove the efficacy of these er herbal components and these herbs actually might uh, <coughs> cause some uh, air drug interactions and would reduce the uh, bioavailab bioavailability of the drugs, of the cancer drugs. So doctors have to be cautious about prescribing these. And uh, so in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, they use uh, complementary medicine for the treatment of uh, cancer. And However, uh, they don't cover the cost of this treatment. They just monitor it, and they regulate uh, the, the, this industry through the National Complementary and Alternative Medicine Center, established by the Ministry of Health. However, uh, they don't cover the cost. So what happens is that usually patients, they go ask their friends, their family, oh, what? what herbs do you use and they take it or they ask like their pharmacist, their pharmacist would give it to them, it's readily available and it's cheap. And also healthcare uh, practitioners in the Saudi Arabia, they don't discuss these, uh, these treatments or these herbs with their patients. So here what happens is that the patient-doctor communication is not very effective because it's like, okay, I take it and this might affect their uh, actual cancer treatment. So there are benefits uh, for uh, the herbs and there are risks. So how can we balance between those two? The benefits include like pain relief, nausea control, mood enhancement, and but there are potential risks, uh, especially when they're receiving the actual treatment. In Palestine, my home country, it's uh, the same uh, most of the things I talked about in Saudi Arabia relate to Palestine. We have the, our mountains are covered with plants and herbal medicine. However, due to deforestation and climate change and uh, degradation, uh, the availability of these plants and herbs is uh, decreasing. So uh, people are using it, but le to lesser extent these days because of the availability. Um, so what I was just talking about is that uh, there's uh, an issue of the patient and uh, uh, doctor uh, communication, and this leads to adverse side effects. Uh, for example, I will tell you, uh, people in Saudi Arabia, due to religious reasons, they drink milk, uh, the camel's urine, or they, they drink the, the, the camel's milk while it's not heated. And this is very dangerous. It causes like brucellosis or respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, that's related, that is actually caused by drinking uh, uh, camel urine. Or another example, people would uh, eat honey because they think it's very effect, uh, it's good due to their religious or cultural beliefs. And then uh, it would uh, cause, it would worsen the, con the, the, the patient's conditions who have diabetes milk. So, and these uh, conversations don't happen in the clinic because p uh, just like the doctors won't talk about it or the patients won't discuss it. So that's why we have to be very cautious when we talk about complementary medicine. So here I suggest a model for the ideal communication between the patient and the healthcare practitioner we can include another uh, third angle that includes the integrative physician. And he's the physician who studied the effects of, uh, of all uh, herbal uh, 
components and he, he knows and he can uh, be the, the link between the patient and the healthcare practitioner. So that's a model that's used in the US, but unfortunately we don't have it back in the Middle East because uh, it's costly. And even in the US it's costly, but some, some hospitals have implemented it and I will talk about it now. So in the US, as you can see in this uh, uh, graph, uh, mostly the priors are, is the most widely uh, used uh, complementary medicine in, uh, between all these uh, 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 Hispanic or non-Hispanic Asians. The, and the second one is the herbal supplement. Um, the herbal supplement is the number one after the, the prayer. So natural product is when we take supplements and they're readily available in the grocery store or the supermarket. They don't need any prescription. They're all natural and they say it helps to treat certain conditions. So that's what people mostly use in the US. And the last one is the guided imagery. So exactly like the Middle East, complementary medicine is, is in the rise, especially the herbal products similar to, um, to the Middle East. And uh, there was a growth of 4% compared to uh, in 2011 compared to 2010. And in 2013, sales of herbal uh, products increased by 8%. So that's very, very increasing very rapidly at a high speed. Uh, and in the US, usually, opposite to their people who have higher incomes are the ones who have access to, to the uh, complementary uh, medicine. Uh, and here they see that there's a study that said that the highest family income had more than four times higher mean per use out of pocket expenditures for visits to complementary practitioners than those with the lowest income. So that's a great difference between high and uh, um, low, middle, low uh, income earners. Um, uh, the cost of professional complementary healthcare clinical services uh, was 12 billion in 2007. And uh, it differs from one state to another, from one insurance to another, because not all insurances cover uh, the visits to complementary medicine, and it's, uh, it's different uh, from state to state. For example, in the state of Washington, uh, they require the private health insurances to cover the services of licensed complementary health care providers. And that's not the case in other states. It's widely vary and it's not very well known. So in my research, I would continue and try to find more statistics about which states and which insurance companies cover these. And this might lead to disparities and uh, ethical injustices in uh, the healthcare system because people who are rich can afford these and poor people can. So it's very uh, critical. Uh, as I said before, integrative medicine has been in the rise and it uh, has many benefits because, uh, especially for the uh, symptom relief, improvement in appetite, fatigue, emotional functioning, anxiety, sleep, and overall global health. And it also had the patients address their personal needs. So the approach was more patient-centered and more directed to the patient. And he, I, like, it would allow them to uh, take the approach that's more appropriate for them, rather than just prescribing medicines that might uh, harm them, actually, more than benefit them. So one example is that the University of Michigan, they introduced an integrative medicine clinic in 2003, and uh, they had uh, positive uh, reactions from this program. Uh, however, why? Because uh, it included a shared decision making between the doctor and the patient, and, uh, and it had many barriers. However, it had many barriers for the implementation. The cost of the program, the price is always a cost for implementing such services at the hospitals. And the lack of, the knowledge, the lack of knowledge of the doctors, because as I said in the beginning of the presentation, that doctors uh, don't study the complementary medicine side in medicine, 
and uh, that's why they might just want to go uh, and uh, and recommend conventional medicine rather than the complementary medicine. There are many methods to eliminate these barriers. I, I know that they might take so much time, but we can get there. Online courses for physicians, for example, or implementing integrative medicine, like the University of Michigan example, and we can develop a counseling integrative team, or we can just refer the patient to a, an, an integrative medicine clinic. So all of these approaches are doable, but they're costly and uh, they might take so much time to be implemented, but it's important to tackle these issues. Uh, and that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you so much, Tina. Very uh, interesting presentation. Thank you again all the speakers today and uh, all the attendees. We have time to take just a few questions. So, no questions. Yes, please. Hello, I uh, enjoyed all the talks. I would like to address this partly as a comment and question to the scholar from India. Um, in 1984, I published a paper called The Moral Significance of the Genetic Relation in the Bioethics Journal. I think there's a copy in your territory. If not, I probably have one. But I don't know if you'd be interested, while you're here, to honor Edinburgh by taking a peek at that. that that's ancient in compared to the day. But I raised all these issues that have to do with, you know, they do have to do with contract law and also morality and you know, poverty and commercialism, the extent of markets. And uh, there were some interesting cases in the news back at that time that I addressed. Now, I didn't come at this with any kind of metaphysics that's going to settle things. And I'm a little bit of a skeptic, but uh, you might be curious to look at that article. I would love to look at it. So uh, I think Jim Drain knows my name. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of you. <laughs> so. Uh, but it, it just struck me that so much of what you were talking about was on, right on target with what I have written about. Uh, so I hope, but it's, it's a jungle of it. It raises every question. Everything. In fact, I always say to people that this whole area of surrogacy is the entire world of bioethics and its concerns, you know, right. all wrapped into this one issue. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a great way to teach bioethics, actually. So you can tease out all the bioethical uh, issues and concerns. But I would love to read that here. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, we still will have time to talk and discuss, we uh, talk to uh, the presenters. We have a reception here, please join us there, and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you so much.